Right. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for another one of the Green Institute's webinars. Today we have with us uh, our moderator for today's session will be Dr. Dwayne Edwards. Dr. Edwards is a senior lecturer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Guyana, where he lectures both to undergraduate and graduate courses uh, in social theory and research. His research areas include ethnic dynamics in plural societies, the social implications of Caribbean philosophical and development thought, and sociocultural systems in developing societies. His main research project had focused on the theoretical linkages between social differential uh, and identity politics. He holds a PhD in sociology from the University of the West Indies and also a Bachelor of Science in sociology from the University of Guyana. Duane, thank you for moderating this morning's session. I am sort of your co-host, the coordinator for the Green Institute, Dr. Anna Pereira. Our director, unfortunately, cannot make it uh, at the moment, but he will join us shortly if he can. He's attending uh, some funeral arrangements. Uh, so Duane, I'll hand it over to you and uh, you can introduce our speaker for this morning, uh, Dr. Janet Bulkan. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Pereira. And first of all, good uh, morning, everyone, or good day, depending on where you're logged in from. And uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate your presence. And uh, we hope you enjoy the session and uh, contribute to the discussion after the presentation by Dr. Bulkan. Uh, Dr. Janet Bulkan is an associate professor in indigenous forestry in the Department of Forestry forestry resource management at the University of British Columbia. She writes extensively on topics related to environmental protection, forestry management, sustainable use of natural resources, indigenous rights, uh, especially the indigenous rights to resources. And uh, she writes both from an academic uh, point of view and also write uh, for public consumption. She engages in public discussion on many of these uh, issues. In that sense, she is a model uh, activist academic, if I may, <laughs> in the sense that her activism in the area of uh, sound environmental management goes hand in hand with her academic research. And if a set in a sense, she is a, in that sense, she is a Rodneyite scholar insofar as her research and practice and praxis informs and uh, enrich each other. Our reputation in the area of uh, sustainable development has earned her uh, a seat on the advisory board of the University of Guyana Green Institute, which is the uh, host of uh, this forum. And, and where she sits in the company of uh, many, od many other uh, academically uh, aviators. And uh, our topic today is on artisanal fisheries, as you see, as projected on the screen there. And she will be examining the safeguards in the Environmental Protection Act and the Sustainable Development Goals. Those following the news in Guyana with regards to the challenges of our fisher folks are uh, facing will know that this is a critical issue in Guyana and this is an issue that has serious implications for uh, food security and other uh, social national issues. Uh, in terms of the format of this presentation, Dr. Bulkan will speak uh, for uh, between maybe 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, after which the audience will be free to ask questions. We, while we prefer that you pose your questions verbally so as to engender a lively discussion on the presentation and the topic, uh, there is also the facility to post your questions in the chat and uh, I can ensure that Dr. Bull can get those questions and uh, respond to them. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Burkan, it's all over to you. Thank you so much, Duane, for that very kind introduction. Never been called an, a Rodney Ed scholar. I'm uh, humbled and 
uh, really moved by that. So thank you. I've, as you will notice on my title slide, I've edited the uh, title of my talk a little to say what we're looking at are no, not safeguards in the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but the metrics which can help us to uh, move towards um, sustainable development. So let's see if I can advance my screen. So my presentation today is in, will follow this uh, thread. First, I'll speak about broad trends in natural resources extractive sectors of which fishing is one, deep sea fishing or fishing offshore. Then I'll move to the precautionary principle and quickly look at a few of the SDGs that I will examine today. Then we'll look at the basis of fishing uh, off the coast of Guyana, the Guyana-Brazil continental shelf and the amazing diversity of species there and why, they, why that diversity. Uh, then to artisanal fisheries, uh, the, the, the fishing that's closest inshore, Pattern, the pattern of decline, which is, vis, which is vis, um, in the available fisheries data, assessing the current artisanal practices against these metrics in the sustainable development goals, the policy responses in Guyana to date, and my concluding thoughts. So what about the linkages between artisanal fisheries and forestry and gold mining in Guyana? Uh, to be sure, Duena, can you see my screen? Good. Yes, Dr. Wilkan, we are seeing. So I've quickly um, categorized these into, uh, into under social, ecological, and economic categories. So socially, we see in all three of these sectors uh, pre prevailing rentier traditions, uh, license holder who gets the license or and, and then rents it to others. And that's reflected in the terms which are used for the mass of workers who uphold these industries, gold mining, forestry, and fisheries. In the Mining Act, they are called tributaries. In the fisheries regulations, workmen and jackmen. They will lead precarious lives. They absorb all the risks. They reap the min min minimal rewards from this work that keeps the Guyana society going. Uh, as you can imagine, over 90% 90 of workers probably do not have not subscribed to the NIS scheme because they are self-employed as far as the industries are concerned. Ecologically, it's uh, mining the ocean, mining the rivers, mining the forests without putting in place the safeguards for uh, sustainable reproduction. That leads to ecosystem degradation on land and on sea, as we are beginning to realize. Economically, the patterns of localized resource extinctions, where uh, these industries are operating, are opposed to the national policies, which intend us to have sustainable production, both ecological and socioeconomic. What exactly what the SDGs, the UN SDGs, uh, aim for and advocate. And in all of these, public resources are privatized. The negative externalities are socialized. So here's part of a map, a UK hydrographic office map. And I chose the um, part of the exclusive economic zone. This area, the EEZ, was declared in 1977 in the Maritime Boundaries Act. It's 64% uh, uh, of the, um, you know, equivalent to 64% of Guyana's land area. So it means that sovereignty, ex, you know, is extended by, you know, there's, if you think of the land mass as 100%, then it's two thirds more where, uh, area where Guyana has sovereignty. Uh, close inshore are where the artisanal fisheries, fishers operate. If you can see my, I don't know if you can see my, my um, cursor, but it's up to this mark uh, of about maybe 20 fathoms, 30, 40 fathoms out. And way over in the northeastern edge is where the FPSO, Liza Destiny, is. So that's close to 200 nautical miles out. And that's what ExxonMobil says, look, we're too far away to have any uh, impact on what fishers are saying or claiming inshore, which is the topic of but I will explore a li little in this talk. 
So what about this offshore petroleum industry in Guyana? What are its um, sort of broad categories? In social terms, there's the politics of territorialization. Yes, they have license. What we see and read about are the appropriation of the, of the space, of this public space, the EEZ, displacement of other rights holders, many articles in the press. We know the, the patronage system is flourishing. You only have to read the newspapers to see the evidence of that. Ecologically, now and for the next 20 years, we are going to see uh, when we move from two FPSOs to 10, the generation and dumping of cubic kilometers, huge amounts of hot produced water contaminated with oil, toxic elements and radioactivity into the surrounding Caribbean Sea. Warming of the ocean, yes, for one FPSO, maybe not much, multiply that by 10, flaring of associated gas, I'll talk a bit more later of the, about the 4D seismic surveys that harm marine life, all marine life, through this deafening noise, the intense boat traffic, which disrupts the migration routes of marine animals. Economic effects, well, in terms of the population onshore, are already, population is already experiencing this, the inflationary ex, uh, effects of uh, catastrophic rises in real estate prices and rents. And then the offshore dumping of wastes, including toxic and radioactive wastes, um, among other social, economic um, and social harms. Now on to the precautionary principle, which is in Guyana's Environmental Protection Act 1996. So I don't expect you to read the entire slide. I'm not going to subject you to that. Um, it goes back, this is not a new concept of the, pre the precautionary principle. Uh, goes back to the Stockholm uh, UN Conference on the Human Environment in 1972. And what it says basically is the regulator or the, the owner of a resource when receiving information about environmental harms or destruction or degradation should not wait for a complete or um, full scientific certainty before taking action. In other words, to prove that there is causation will take time, will you know, require um, data sets that go back over years. So that lack of, of scientific certainty should not be used as an excuse because if action is not taken, the risk is that environmental degradation will proceed so much that they will be irreversible. What about now? Let me talk a little bit about a few of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of them, as you can see here, these icons, which sort of uh, um, simply uh, encapsulate a key um, aspiration of the SDGs. And together, these 17 uh, goals aim to produce, to transform nation states and to transform the planet we live on. They aim to, as they say, to uh, lift up the poor among the poorest sectors of society, to ensure equity, to sustain the basis of life on earth below water and on land, and to create strong institutions. These are not binding on member states. Uh, they are um, aspirational and they are intended to Member states are, are intended to use them to guide strategy, to guide policy development and implementation. And of course, the monitoring of uh, what happens, uh, you know, of progress, monitoring of progress or assessment. SDGs, um, member states are then finally, it's, it's envisaged you will be a final large meeting in 2030. So between 2015 and 2030, countries are encouraged to sign up to, to conduct what are called voluntary national, national reviews. And these are basically to um, assess countries and governments to assess where they are, what progress they've achieved. Um, are they really meeting this pledge to leave no one behind in their countries? So it's a snapshot in time of where the country stands in sustainable um, development implement, uh, implementation. Guyana uh, submitted in July of 2019 
prepared by the Ministry of Finance, its first voluntary national review. Of course, we don't have time today to go through it, but what we can say, or what, I, what you will notice if you do a, a search, that there's a, really a lack of data for many sectors, including fisheries, and this is really problematic. So I'm going to move on to a few of the SDGs, those that relate, a few that relate to the biophysical bases of life on earth and focus on life below water, life on land. Some that uh, relate to socioeconomic as aspects of, um, of, of human society and of our nation state, uh, decent work, peace, justice, equity, and then those with policy aims, zero hunger, climate action. Knowing, of course, this can only be a real gallop through a very, you know, deep and rich subject. Let's think about zero hunger as for starters. Here is the, each of the SDGs has targets and countries report on their targets. So target 2.3 of goal number two says by 2030, that's when countries are all going to report, uh, they will double the agricultural productivity and incomes of small scale food producers. This is really targeted at the mass of the society where there are people who are producing and reproducing the food, the food that is generally eaten nationally. And it mentions fishers, talks about secure and equal access to land, other productive resources and inputs, knowledge, that means education in many forms, financial services, markets, and opportunities for value addition. Uh, in this review period for Guyana, Guyana's Voluntary National Review, it's um, the years 2015 to 2018. And what, the, what Guyana has, um, what we have is what I have on the, the right-hand side of my screen, displays aggregated data for agriculture, fishing, forestry, GDP, at current basic prices. Now, A, it's aggregated, so you can't tell what real fishing comes into it, but this is not what this target is about, target 2.3. Target 2.3 is not about distributing hampers. It's not about calories. It's about targeted interventions to make structural changes in society that can lift the poor out of poverty. So the basis of our of fishing in Guyana go back to the Guyana-Brazil continental shelf, life below water. Here's a map uh, of the Guyana current, which sweeps from the Amazon, out through the mouth of the Amazon into this northwesterly direction along the coasts of French Guyana, Suriname, Guyana, past uh, Trinidad and Tobago, moving northwesterly. Uh, this is um, th this current brings what we call what I can what many people call the gift of the Amazon to our shores. It's full of it's moving at a fairly constant rate, twelve to, of two knots. Uh, it's moving along the, the continental shelf. It's quite shallow, uh, moving about a hundred meters to a thousand meters gradually, and then it drops into the abyss of the shelf, which is where Exxon Mobil is operating. Uh, in the northeast of this map. And so fish eggs and juveniles are driven along by this current. This leads to the high diversity of species and formerly the abundance of species because what's coming with this current, it's mud and sandbars. The, the, mud, the mud flats are quite long, 40 kilometers, and they are, you know, sort of there, they uh, and have mineral nutrients in them and that's what the fish and the are feeding on. So Kayana has, there's no shortage of food for fish uh, brought in this steady current, which the fish are accustomed to, and they um, are able to have been able to thrive on this, this um, immense di di diversity and abundance. These mud flats are move, move as well intermittently. We know that from the studies, particularly in French Guyana and that done by, um, some in Suriname. And so there are these cycles of erosion and accretion in the man coastal mangrove forests, which are important spawning and nursery areas for some species of fish and shrimp. And, and that invertebrate fauna nourishes the demersal species, the bottom feeders, which um, those of you who are Guyanese know we like in Guyana, gilbaca, 
Banga Mary and so on that feed at the bottom. And at the last FAO reports I saw said that in the Guyana area, there were 501 species of marine fishes only. Well, what little fishers are saying? So there's a discharge that comes out of the, the bushes from the Amazon, but also from the great rivers of Guyana. There are nine major rivers and other smaller rivers. Hydromet agrees that this rate of discharge has much increased and Hydromet says it's climate change that causes it. What this means is that there's relatively warm fresh waters which are coming into the coast as well, um, probably because of climate change at greater volumes and on a, at different times. That changes or these discharges are changing the coastal salinity. The fishermen know this very well and the near surface temperature heating it up. So some commercial fish, which are at the level of tolerance of heat, when they get this, these greater discharges are probably moving offshore into cooler and more saline waters. Fishers say that over the generations, they've learned to follow the fish to these offshore grounds during the wet season. But as their declines that, they, you, know, that you read about in the paper, as these declines in their in the volume of commercial species uh, are being felt, fishers are moving even in dry season further out to catch fish. So we who buy fish in the markets, we don't notice that because fishes are going further, fishers are going further out for Gilbaca. They're spending extra time there. We see the same fish, we see the prices more, but we do not get, we the public, the Guyanese public, we do not appreciate that there are these massive changes happening, leading to this need for fishers to go further out. SDG, the target 14.4 says, government, sh government should be monitoring fish stocks to ensure they are within biologically sustainable levels. What does Guyana National Voluntary National Review say in its uh, reporting? No data available. Uh, target 14.7.1 talks about sustainable fisheries as a percentage of GDP. Page 129 of Guyana's Voluntary Nation, Na National Review, no data available. 14B, really important, providing access for small scale artisanal fishers to marine resources and markets, no data available. So because marine, these fish, it's an indivisible ocean, the fish, the marine populations are moving. And so clearly we need a coordinated regional approach to marine management. The three Guyanas, Brazil, Venezuela. Uh, the big international NGOs, WWF and Conservation Interna International in particular, have and have had um, many marine focused projects. But to be fair, I would say that they have tended to focus on the, the top of the trophic um, pyramid on cetaceans and reptiles on the charismatic megafauna. And there's less focus on fish and fishers, which are more pedestrian concerns. And so this is where governments come in. Governments to have this sustained collaboration and monitoring and assessment, bearing in mind how important the sector is for coastal livelihoods, for affordable prote fish protein, and for a cultural sense of who we are as Guyanese enjoying Banga Mary, Kofam, Snook, and so on. So now moving to life on land, the life of the artisanal fishers. Their livelihoods, their, and the fa their family's health and ours are interdependent on this a resilient coastal ecosystem. All over the world, people are registering the impacts, the negative impacts from warming ocean temperatures. Fishers experience this. They're experiencing the changing rainfall patterns I mentioned earlier. They bitterly talk about the pollution that comes from off the coast of, coast of Guyana, where people are throwing unbelievable uh, garbage into rivers and let's flush out into the sea. And just it's just a horrible mess. And most recently, there are claims against the offshore petroleum industry, which I will come to. How are they, who are artisanal fishers? Well, here is a WWF um, definition. These are traditional fisheries, tradition comes to their fishing households. They're not commercial scale. They're using, using relatively small amounts of capital and energy. 
Uh, they're relatively small vessels or none, none at all. If you've stood on the seawall, maybe you've seen a catamaran go out, a little box uh, in the middle for fish on a piece of board as like one ski and a, a man who uh, lies on it and paddles out to his fish pen, amazing. They make short fishing trips close to shore and supply the local market mainly. So in practice, an artisanal fisher, the definition varies. Uh, so it can be for subsistence. And of course, some of it has to be for commercial because a fisher family needs to send their children to school, buy books, pay for medicines and so on. The Guyana Fisheries Department here, and this I've taken from their 2019 Marine Fisheries Management Plan, they have these four categories of artisanal fishers. I should only be looking in this talk because of time at the first two categories, the artificial sea bob fishers. And this is a shrimp called a sea bob and the, what are called the Bangamere boats. These are between lar larger boats between eight and 18 meters in length. There are about a thousand of these boats. They're not only catching Bangamere, but that's generally how they're referred to. Um, they are dropping gill nets into the sea, which are affixed to the sides of their boats. And they use actually larger mesh size. They're aiming to catch the Bangamere we see in the market. So about 12 inches long. And so that allows the smaller fry to escape uh, through their net sizes. The artisanal sea bob, and I'll show you a photograph of their, um, of their cod, the, the cod end of their nets. They are looking to trap the small shrimp and so they are using what are called fixed spike nets or Chinese seine that are fixed um, in these fish pens. Here's a photograph of a fish pen with the seine stretched between the poles. And this is in the Burbies River estuary. Here's the fisher or two fishers going to check their seines for fish and shrimp. This is part of a UK hydrographic office map. And I, uh, don't know if you can you do it. Can everyone see my cursor or no? I, I'm not sure. Maybe yes, not. you're seeing the cursor. Oh, brilliant. So yeah. here's the channel which the force of the Demerara River coming out has cut, and which of course is being um, is sometimes dredged to, particularly for the Exxon mobile boats. You can see here, maybe you can see in the blue um, areas in blue, that these are called areas which it says entry prohibited fishing stakes. So in the official maps of Guyana, these are the shallow areas. You might see uh, one meter deep, uh, really one meter deep here. These are protected and fishers' rights are recognized. Here is a map of the Barbese Channel. So you can see here, again, the, the channel is going out and fishing stakes are protected. Uh, these fish pen license have been issued for annual, an annual fee for decades, I don't have, I don't know when they began, and I intend to try and check that. Uh, they, to give you a sense of the of the the scale of fish pen license, uh, uh, Ministry of Agriculture's annual report for 2015 says the um, sales brought in a quarter million Guyana dollars. These fish pen license run the length of the Guyana coast, and there's a, the regulations that specify the space between fish pens to prevent tangling and unfair competition. And of course that space allows fry to, the small fish to, to run free. This is a property right in law and in custom recognized by the FAO and by the government of Guyana. So these custom, fishers have both customary rights and legal rights. ExxonMobil has a legal right, so have fishers. And it's really important to keep that in mind. Uh, Quickly now, the pattern of decline in available data that we can see. Why this pattern of decline? Well, one common view really is that, and as I mentioned, they, the, there's no shortage of food offshore of Guyana coming from the Amazon. And so there's this common view that natural resources are inexhaustible. In forestry, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, that wood can't done. But you know what? We have commercialized, localized commercial ex extinction of commercial species. Juveniles are, on, sadly, for some fish which are um, um, commercially um, important, 
are caught. So here is a photograph of sharks from a coastal market. Um, and this means that these sharks are not going to be allowed to grow to maturity for the females to have eggs and to produce the next generation. Uh, particularly in the shrimp fishing, the sea bob fishing, nets with very small mesh in the cod ends lead to high mortality rates. And the high rate of discards of the bycatch, particularly in this shrimp fishing, um, is probably having a, a, a result on the decline. But we do not know because of the lack of studies, we can't prove causation. Here's an uh, illustration of the cod end of a, of a sea bob net. I, as you can see, it's about 2.5 to 3.5 centimeters if it's open. But remember in the water, it's stretched as the water is moving. And so nothing can escape from this cod end. And so if you we think about the larger scale, the industrial scale for CBOB with these tight cod ends, where the, what's the, what the industry is interested in are the CBOB only, but the fish are, are going to that net as well, you know, that funnel into that funnel, they're trapped, they're squeezed, the mortality rate is 100%, probably leaving to decline. And that cycle of decline, we don't have time in this talk, is true of all the fisheries um, for which we have data. The snapper fishery from the late 50s to the 70s, the prawn fishery, I, I'll show you a, a graph uh, for 2000, up to 2004, the uh, gradual decline in demersal fish and shrimp, which is in the Bank of Guyana reports, all species or locations, sea bob fish, fishery as well. So these larger scale, industrial scale fishers will affect and do affect the fate of the artisanal fisheries and fishers because they all share the same spawning grounds inshore. Some of those are in the mangroves and the spawn and the young fish of some species are food for species which are higher up the trophic pyramid. You destroy the basis at the bottom from too much destruction of the bycatch and the, the fry, you are going to affect all of your fisheries. This shows you, this is from the FAO's data, 1983 to 2004. If I were to carry this and I could have to 2020, that decline continues to a point where prawn, prawn production is infinitesimally small. Uh, here you can see the sea bob. This is the industrial sea bob um, catch. You can see here in 2001, there is um, really the peak at 25,000 tons and then beginning in about 2003, a sharp drop off. This is again, this is FAO's data. These are Bank of Guyana reports, all species. And again, you can see this gradual decline in uh, the amount of, uh, um, the, of what of, of fish that are landed in Guyana. So from 60,000 in 2003, by 2021, there's a sharp down to 20,000. So one third, um, one third, uh, reduction. And here, because fishers have been saying from about 2019, our catches are re reducing um, dramatically, you can see that reflected in the data, the sharp drop off between 2019 and 2021. Similar story, this again, Bank of Guyana reports from 2003 to 2021, you see this sharp drop off in landed shrimp catches. Again, they are measuring the sea uh, bob, um, but the de decline again is quite dramatic be between 2019 and 2021. So what about the current artisanal practices? Thinking of them against the SDGs. As I've mentioned, artisanal fishers are operating at the coastal margins, but in the same indivisible sea. Only about 20 or 30 of the species are commercially desirable. If fishers offer others in the markets, we won't buy them. As I mentioned, the Bangamary mesh size is really geared to the fully grown 12 inch Bangamary. So the fry can escape. They're probably not, you know, fry of Bangamary and other species. But it's the use of the cod end in the sea bob fisheries, which is destroying bycatch. And approximately 70% of each haul. So that's a, quite a lot of fish which are not going to fetch a high price or are not commercially desirable are discarded dead. 
So within the three Guyanas, the steepest declines, this, uh, this is a, a, a quotation from the auditor who, uh, the, of Marine Stewardship Council, uh, which, has worked, which has audited the seabob fisheries in Guyana and first in Suriname and then in Guyana. And they've noted the steepest declines are registered in Guyana's territorial sea. And maybe if we have time for questions, I can suggest to you why that might be. In Guyana, artisanal fishers are reporting 50% to 75% reduction in their catches. And this is apart from the seasonal variations. And as I mentioned, they're going further out to sea, spending more days at sea in order to maintain their catch totals. The high rates of discard in, of dead fish in the industrial seabob fisheries, which is 98% of the seabob fishery, uh, here's a, here's a, um, an, a report from Kelleher in 20, 2005, it's 70%. So clearly this is probably going to be a barometer of ecosystem health on which the artisanal fisheries are dependent. Uh, in 2020, here's a quotation from an FAO report on Guyana, the problem of discarding large amounts of fin fish persists. And this is, this, this, these are discards not of live fish that can swim away, but 100% dead. Um, I'm just going to mention quickly, I, I don't know if she's in the audience, Liana Kalichuran, lecturer at UG, did her study in 2016, where she looked at, she looked at 76, or she measured the halls from 76 Seine halls, and she found that the discards were 69% of the total weight. And as she mentioned, most fin fish discards were small, they included juveniles of 15 species of importance to other fisheries. So it gives us a sense of the cumulative impacts on the um, resources out there from both fishing and climate change. Quickly, I'm going to mention another study from um, a University of Ghana graduate, Sophia Edgehill. She looked at 18 fish landings on the lower east coast of Demerara in 2018. 20, 38 species are, um, she were recorded. So that gives you a, a sense again of the diversity, but the bycatch which was discarded, 100% mortality rate, which is frightening. So yes, a decline and boats are pitched up and rotting away in the mud. Fishers have parked their boats and they've been complaining in the press over the last few years about no fish in the sea. So what does it say about socioeconomic aspects? Well, artisanal fisheries are important. Important to us, the coastal population and our sense of who we are. You know, we, we really, we, we, if you think about it, we have, we have the shared identity as, you know, we know what Bangamere is and Gilbaka and Snook and Kafam and so on. Important to the fishers themselves, important to our food security, our, what used to be a cheap source of protein no longer is. So it's important, artisanal fisheries are important in economic terms, social terms, cultural terms. And the numbers of people who are working in artisanal fisheries is about one tenth of the working population. Their fates depend on, their, you know, their livelihoods depend on fisheries. And more than that, their, li their livelihoods also are intertwined with ours. Without them working, that and without them guarding and, and, and tracking what's happening in the ocean, we have no idea what's going on out there. Globally, Guyana had quite a high con, um, average of fish consumption per year. Uh, we, it was according to FAO, it was about 40 kilograms per person per year in 2003, reduced by a third 10 years later into about 30 kilograms or under 30 kilograms per person per year. And I, without knowing what the data is, clearly lower per capita consumption now because fish prices are higher than chicken prices. And many people can't afford either chicken or fish to put on their children's tables. Greater percentage of fish from, from all of these fishers are exported now to the Guyanese who live abroad in New York, Miami, and who can pay higher prices, which all makes fishing more um, you know, unavailable. So what are the baseline studies telling us? Well, they're not in the public domain. The last assessments of biodiversity were done in, by Roma Connell and her team in the late 50s. We just don't have population studies to tell us what's going on out there. Uh, here's a little quote, I'm not going to read it, 
from Carl Greenwich, who was writing in, this was published in 1983, and he was reflecting about the ways in which there was so little research uh, in the Caribbean Sea. He's quoting a man called White Leather, and White Leather oh. says the lack of research seems almost incredible. And that was in 1962. Greenwich says three decades later, he's writing, it's quite embarrassing to observe that little has changed in that respect. Well, four decades later after Mr. Greenwich wrote, we are in the same position, no ongoing research in the public domain to allow us, as, they, as Carl says, to meaningfully map out the resources and their characteristics to assess the impact of the environment on the stocks of the resources. I'm quoting him here. So the, the um, private sector, they won't do this because they are their goals are quite different. This is a job, as the SDG says, for the owner of the resource, us, governments, and the regulator. So quickly, I'm going to just show you a few use. You know these, if you're Guyanese and you've looked at the papers, Fishers are complaining of catching hell, reduction in catches, uh, fish and shrimp production declining from 2019 for two years now, taking licks at sea, less fish in the sea. Well, for those who can afford it, um, you can begin to buy imported fish. Probably it's not wild caught fish. It's probably grown in some um, you know, fish farm somewhere, but that's part of the emerging reality of Guyana. Fishers complain that part of the reason is what they say it's vibration, but they never quite, uh, what I think perhaps they mean by vibration, it's the impact of these, size, these ships, which are, here's an example of one with the, with the long lines from which uh, they're doing 4D seismic surveys 24 seven. And these started in 2013, so 10 years almost uh, with these seismic surveys. And here is the report, a recent report from Haskell talking about an ocean of noise. And what does this mean for our fish and marine life? As he said, these are um, air guns. Those uh, air guns are on, uh, on, um, linked to those long lines and they're shooting pressurized air into the water punching, there's a, they punch sound waves into the water to allow the geologists to build up a picture of what's underneath that seabed. But as, he's, as, as Haskell says, like a, the, you know, when whales are listening to the ping of a, a Chinook salmon to go and find a salmon, this is not it. This is using sound, the companies are using sound to find their quarry, but these seismic surveys can be heard up to 2,500 miles away. Our EEZ is 200 miles. So clearly those noises from the seismic surveys are probably not clearly, probably being heard across the EEZ and beyond. Sound, it's huge, it's deafening. As uh, Haskell says, as loud as 260 underwater decibels six to seven orders of magnitude more intense than the loudest ship. And these are going off every 10 to 20, 12, 20, 20 seconds. They've been going on methodically back and forth for the last 10 years in Guyana's EEZ. Now this, if anyone picks up the Guyana newspapers, you will see notices to mariners like this. This is one is number 76, so 76 such notices published uh, by Marad. And they are really saying, uh, look, these three ships, they've named them, are operating, are working uh, in the area, that area which is outlined in red. <clears throat> so all other boats, be aware of them, maintain a wide berth, and so on. Fishers don't see this. But what fishers see are that they are being displaced. They are being, um, they're seeing their traditional fishing grounds disrupted and destroyed by these seismic surveys I mentioned, by the geotechnical surveys that are disturbing the seabed, by all the surveys that are going on for routes, for more and more routes of pipelines and cables. Laying of cables from these FPSOs, there are going to be 10 of them soon to shore bases, and those are going to last for 20 years. They are getting no compensation for tour nets. There have been several articles in the newspaper, no response from anyone, not Exxon or anyone. They're ordered by megaphones to clear out of designated working areas. They say, you know, this, this boat pulls alongside us. 
here's a megaphone, someone in another accent telling us, get out, get out, get out. Now, Marit is publicizing that you should get out, but Mar that's not reaching the fishers. So fishers can't prove that the declining catch is caused by Exxon operations. So they, according to Exxon, they can't claim compensation because Exxon will say to them, can I see your TIN number? Can I see your NIS number? Can you prove, well, if you're Guyanese, you know they don't have those things. So in such a context, the precautionary principle should be applied, which is in our EPA Act section four. We should be insisting, the EPA should insist that ExxonMobil and all of these other license holders for petroleum exploration and production should be exercising due diligence as is clearly we have cumulative effects from all of these uh, global to local impacts. For example, they could be required to do chemical tests along these pipelines as they're laying them on the cable lines in dry season and in wet season in the fishing grounds. They could be asked, required to put hydrophones over the sides and record the noise while they're drilling, cementing, pumping, se seismic surveys, dumping that polluted water, and all those other activities which are generating underwater noise. They're not being required to do that. They are not exercising due diligence. So as Simon Mangal says, it's they're ramping up production for their uh, aims, their ends. It's a reckless changing after money no, nothing to do with what Guyana's public policy should be. What we can say is there is a catastrophic decline in catches, and these appear to coincide in time with uh, the exploration and production and seismic surveys since 2013. Correlation is not causation, but there is this uh, record of cumulative effects. Fishers themselves, most are illiterate. When you talk to fishers, they started to work from 11 years old, 12 years old, very no capital, no collateral. They are very much um, you know, operating on the edge and can't go further out than they do because they have no keels on their boats. And so they are really going to just stay longer out there. I know I'm running out of time, Duane. <laughs> um, here, I'm just gonna mention to you that wages are very low. The skilled mender of nets, earns just 20, 20, U, 20 US dollars per day. Uh, boat owners will earn between 20, 37 and 80, depending on the, if it's a good day or bad. Uh, cleaners and workers earn between 10 and 15 US dollars per day. So fishers are very are price takers. The people they buy the ice from, when they get the ice to go out into, into their boats, are the ones who buy their fish. So the fishers really have to sell at whatever price they are the ice suppliers give them. They have no added value, no associations that are functioning, no trades union support, nothing equivalent to the support which sugar industry workers are receiving. They lack a politically effective voice, as I mentioned, and they are now competitive among themselves for this resource, which they say is in sharp decline. Policy responses in Guyana? Well, we want a double fish production. This is not, uh, uh, sensible policy response to double fish production when we have no when we are hearing about declines and we need to protect the remaining biodiversity, the remaining commercially important fish. Fish cages, well, this is a very daft idea that the president um, is going to spend, he says, 200 million Guyana dollars. These are usually for carnivorous schooling fish, which can be fe fed with pelletalized food that they need, those fish need clear water to see and smell the pellets. They need strong tidal flushes to discourage parasites. They need calm water for secure anchorages of cages such as fjords, locks, deep and sheltered bays. None of those conditions are found in Guyana's coastal waters. So my, now my concluding thoughts. There's a, probably a concatenation of possible factors leading to the decline in fish catches. We do not have conclusive data. We know petroleum related activities have been ongoing and ramping up since 2013. We know about global heating. We know about greater flushes of fresh water into the ocean. We know about high rates of discards of dead small fry from the sea bob fisheries. Probably there's overfishing at every scale. Public, what's, what's public, could be public, public policy responses? Well, uh, we now have oil money. We should be compensating seabob fishers. There are 300 
boats so that they have a closed season at the same time as the industrial seabob fishery. It's about six weeks. We could also be compensating boat owners and crews, some of them to retire their boats so that just take and compensating them so that they are not fishing for X months of the year or for whatever. We should be having collaborative research with fishers and different kinds of nets, particularly for this Chinese same fisheries. Um, you know, we just need to be able to track what's happening to artisanal fisheries in Guyana sustainable development goals. No data as we saw, as I showed you in Guyana's voluntary national re review, and we need to fill that to allow fish to be get to be back where it can be a source of cheap protein or affordable protein for our households. There are possibilities in the law. The EPA could sue some of these people in the Guyana Maritime Zones Act of 2010 sets out summary conviction here at fines and imprison people who are dumping harmful waste and hazardous circumstances. So my last, this is my final slide for University of Guyana students. And this is where I think if I want to leave you with any, any sort of um, thought to think bear in mind is how important it is that this be researched so that artisanal fishers and their allies are visible in Guyana's SDGs. To, so that the powerless in our society get a seat at the tables, the organizational tables, which structure and shape what we value. What are the stories we hear and read about? Who is vulnerable in our society? What's happening to the common property, legal and customary of artisanal fishers? What about procedural, procedural justice? And which development pathway are we going to take which will see us, see us into the future beyond ExxonMobil? Are we going to have it rooted in the sustainable development goals or in something else? Thank you very much. And I'm sorry, Duane, I've gone over my time. Happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bulkan. Uh, that was definitely a very comprehensive assessment 